Well, hey everybody, I'm John Redlin with every Impact Wrestling World Champion ranked from worst to best. NWA TNA era, all the way to the current Impact Wrestling era, and everything in between. Also going to be talking about the World Tag Team Championships, the X Division, and the Knockout Championships and respective lists at some point. Their world title, whether it was NWA TNA, TNA, the failed Global Force uh, Wrestling merger thing that did not work at all, or the current Impact Wrestling World Championship, you know, um, <coughs> era, it has always been seen as the premier title, and that is one refreshing thing about Impact. I mean, there's other things, don't get me wrong. I haven't been able to keep up on as much current Impact Wrestling, except for their respective champions, how well they've done and everything, and that's why I'm covering them in this list, because it's about time to pay respect to how Impact Wrestling has really, you know, made a world title mean something. They aren't the only company, of course, but more often than not, with a few issues, you know, and a few, uh, few exceptions, they have actually made many people feel important whenever they put on that main world title. So, let's jump right on into it with 31 different men. We start off with number 31, Alberto El Patron, one reign, 43 days. This was during the failed uh, Global Force Wrestling merger thing, bullshit or whatever. It was bad. That match against Lashley was bad. Lashley deserved a whole lot better, and he didn't hold it very long. Alberto didn't because he ended up having issues with the company, and they had to strip him of the title and everything, and it was goddamn bullshit, and Lashley should have just won it right there. I get why they went with Alberto, but it was a mistake. It was a total mistake. It was a failure of <clears throat> the highest goddamn order. Apparently, they thought that he was going to be somebody big for them, and it d simply did not work. And it's a shame, because there were a lot of hardworking people uh, in Impact at that time. I mean, there still are, but I'm just saying in that in that whole rebuilding thing where they've been rebuilding for quite a while and hey they got this access tv deal that's great and alberto is nowhere near there and that is fantastic but yes he is known to me in my opinion as the worst impact wrestling world champion just period i mean it's just because it was unnecessary and it, it it caused a lot of damage to the company when the company could not afford damage like that so we get to number 30 Rhino, one reign, two days, and it was for when they had the NWA title. So he is a former NWA champion. Uh, after Kevin Nash went down with, I believe, some kind of heart condition or something, it was some kind of medical condition, he could not compete against Jeff Jarrett at Bound for Glory 2005. So they didn't go necessarily into panic mode, but they were like, well, shit, what do we do? Oh, well, we had this four-way match, uh, Monsters Ball match, and Rhino won, and then we had a 10-man uh, battle royal, and Rhino won that, and then... They kind of did like the Raven, uh, Terry Funk, barely legal 97 match for ECW, <clears throat> where Raven hit the ring and everything and then just beat up Terry Funk, but then Terry Funk ended up winning. So they did the same thing here with Jeff Jarrett. I think it was Tito Ortiz was the referee. Um, and that was that was pretty goddamn silly. But you end up having uh Jeff you end up having Rhino beat Jeff Jarrett despite all this interference and all this stuff and everything. And yeah, that's what ended up happening. He had a, Rhino ended up becoming NWA TNA champion for a couple days. He lost it soon afterwards. But hey, he got to close out the show as an NWA world champion, so credit to him. And then we get to number 29, Pentagon Jr. One reign, he held it for a couple days. I think he beat Austin Aries, and that was it. Just It was a shame that it didn't last that, last that long. This was the Lucha Underground uh, Impact merger when Lucha Underground was really on its goddamn ass and so many of the talents. We're just going there to, um, I don't remember all the finer details of it, but they were just doing that as a way to get work. And Pentagon's legit, do not get me wrong, but just the fact they did such a quick quick title change back, I got to rank him this low. We then get to number 28, James Storm. One reign, eight days. Well, after Bobby Roode or Robert Roode could not beat uh, Kurt Angle at <clears throat> Bound for Glory, uh, James Storm suddenly, uh, you know, face Kurt Angle, and it was a really, really short match. Sudden last call, super kick, one, two, three. And then he dropped it to Bobby Roode like eight days later. I think I, th I think it was eight days. I think it was like eight days later. It might have been It might have been like a couple weeks, but just the way that they, they, did, they did the tapings. Uh, Storm did not have a very long run, which is unfortunate. Now, I know he's working in the current NWA, uh, you know, company that uh, Billy Corgan's heading. It's just a shame that he didn't get to have a bit of a longer run. But then they actually did uh, develop a pretty good goddamn feud between him and Robert Roode. So that was pretty good stuff. Short reign, though. Number 27, Chris Saban, one reign, 28 days. This was the second uh, year that Option C, taking the X Division title and cashing it in to um, get a world title shot, was used. Unfortunately, it did not catch fire like Austin Aries did the year before. It's nothing against Chris Saban. He had fought through two 
ACL tears, and it was pretty goddamn brutal. The fact that he had one, he had one in 2011, and then he came back in 2012 for a little bit, and then injured. It was either the same one or is or is in the different in the other knee. The bottom line is, is two ACL tears back to back, seemingly not exactly great. And then he came back. He beat Bully Ray for a little bit. It didn't last very long. Uh, yeah, less than a month. Not really all that memorable, which is unfortunate because Chris Saban is a hell of a talent. But yeah, that that's pretty much it right there. We get to number 26. Ken Shamrock, one reign, 49 days. The first ever NWA TNA era champion. Uh, he, I think he beat the four. I think he beat the former Wall from uh, WCW. I think he was known as Malice at the time. And yeah, I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. I love Ken Shamrock, and I'm glad he won it, and that's credibility right there. He won a world championship in a wrestling company when he should have in WWE, but they didn't want that, And but I digress. That will be another story for another day. In a loss to Ron Killing soon afterwards, and then he was gone from the company very soon. I don't know if it was just because he was only signed on for a few shows or what, but hey, he's first champion. I got to rank him up a little bit here, even if it's low. At least we're getting into some better champions at this point. We get to number 25, Abyss, one reign, 56 days, the NWA title. Yeah, it was at Genesis 06 after Sting had won it from Jeff Jarrett just a month before. And they did this whole thing where nobody, some older school fans may have remembered the NWA title could change via DQ if they, if they wanted to implement that rule. The problem is, is nobody told anybody about that. And then because Sting went nuts, pushed the rep, and then sent Abyss through a bunch of tables, he got he got disqualified. And then Abyss won the title via disqualification. Now, he held it for almost two months, did successfully defend it at the next um, pay-per-view, which I want to say was Turning Point 06. I want to say, but sometimes those things, you know, sometimes stuff gets jumbled in my head. It's just a shame because Abyss wasn't really seen as much of a world champion. He was kind of just like almost an afterthought. And he was given the title just for like a little bit. And then he and then he lost and he never tasted gold again except the exhibition title. Yeah, they did that. That that wasn't a very good idea. That's all due respect to Abyss. All due respect to Abyss. Do not get me wrong. But anyway, yeah, that 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 happened. We then get to number 24, Eric Young, one reign, 70 days. I like Eric Young. I think Eric Young deserves a whole lot better than he's currently gay in WWE. But his world title run, if it wasn't strictly based around Daniel Bryan, you know how Daniel Bryan got this sudden push and everything, I don't know what is. And that's not faulting Eric Young. That's faulting the creative and impact, which was probably Dixie and whoever the hell else it was. I mean, Eric Young becoming world champion was fine. It was actually pretty good because the man had worked extremely hard for years and years and years, put up with a whole bunch of bullshit. But no matter how much they tried to make him credible, it just didn't work. It, it just didn't, at least at this time, because they took him from being a goof <coughs> to serious and world elite. And then he teamed with uh, Orlando Jordan. And I know I'm jumping back a few years, but then they kept making him a goof. Anytime they would make him serious... It just did. It just didn't work at all. Well, I mean, actually, he did team up with Nash Hall and um, Six. Well, Six Pac. You know, when he w when he was there, really, really quick, or really, really briefly, when they were the band, getting the band back together. But yeah, when they started making him a goof again, and then they find him in the world champions, like great. But people, I think some people bought into it, but also a lot of fans were just like, okay, you're only copying this because of that. And that's not even faulting the that's not even faulting the wrestlers. That's faulting Dixie. But whatever, WWE's ripped off Impact a whole bunch too, and that's a whole other story to get into another day. Good for Eric Young, not the most memorable reign though. <clears throat> then we get to number 23, Mr. Anderson, Anderson, two reigns, 64 days. Yeah, let's see, he, he won it in early 2011, and then lost it back to Jeff Hardy, and then won it again a little bit later, and then lost it to Sting. Yeah, I mean, when you got two reigns and they barely equal over two months combined, that's that's not very good. There's nothing against Mr. Anderson. It just it, Anderson, but I don't think that I, I don't think he was a world champion. You know, he was world champion material, and it's kind of a shame that that's what he that that his reigns are remembered as. Oh, yep, they happened. So then we get number twenty three. We get Matt, or actually number twenty two rather. We get to Matt Hardy. Two reigns, 69 days. Nice. Yeah, this is... <sighs> Matt Hardy is a, really, is a really good wrestler. He really is. He reinvented himself. 
in WWE. He really reinvented himself in Impact Wrestling. And now he's doing whatever the fuck he's doing in WWE again. I just didn't buy him as a world champion. It was cool that he won it. Do not get me wrong. It was cool that he won it, but it's like shit. I mean, he was a great he's a great heel. It was great when he turned it when he turned heel and won it. I believe he won it from EC3. And it held it for a bit, and then Drew McIntyre cashed in on him. Well, he let's see, he won it at Bound for Glory 2015. And that was when they were in between networks and stuff like that. And then and then they and then he won it like on the first, I think the first Destination America show or something like that, or whatever it was, or maybe it's Pop TV. He it just it just didn't work. It just ultimately didn't work. And nothing against Matt, no matter how hard he tried, he didn't hold the title long enough to really have it be anything meaningful. And that's a real shame. But then we get Drew Galloway. One reign, 89 days. Well, he cashed in the feaster fired, not money in the bank briefcase. I'm sorry, I just can't ignore how blatant that one was. And he cashed in on Matt Hardy and held it for a while. And Drew Galloway is as legit as they come as far as like an athlete and everything. But it just, this is one of those ultimately it didn't work either. And I feel bad for saying that. But 89 days, I mean... I know it's not, and I was praising Impact Wrestling earlier in the uh, countdown. Do not get me wrong. Them making these guys champions was not the issue. The creative just didn't seem to be behind them. And this is also when Impact was kind of going through, you know, a state of flux. So sometimes some of these champions, as good as they are, may not be remembered as well as as they should be. But hey, you still held for three months. It, 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 didn't, it did work, but it didn't work. I don't know. What's your guys' opinions? Leave them in the comments. Number 20, Eddie Edwards, one reign, 97 days. Well, Eddie Edwards was the better of the American Wolves. Nothing against Davey Richards, but Eddie Edwards was better. He could be more of the breakout single star. Not that Davey wasn't capable, but I stand by what I said. Eddie Edwards winning it was cool and everything, but they kind of just nullified everything after he was suddenly no longer champion. Like now he's done this whole weird heel turn and stuff like that, and he's kind of gotten a little more aggressive, which is great, because he is a hell of a worker and, can, and is a very versatile performer, but I almost feel like his reign was just remembered, like, okay, it happened, cool, but then did any did, did the vast majority of people care? That's nothing against Eddie Edwards. Did the vast majority of people buy him as a world champion? As far as legit athleticism, absolutely. But, I don't know. Again, leave your thoughts in the comments. We get to number 19, EC3, two reigns, 104 days. Well, he held the title, I think it was like from sometime in like July of 2015, just after uh, just after Slammiversary 2015. He held it till Bound for Glory when it was like Drew Galloway, Matt Hardy, and EC3 in a three-way match where Drew Galloway got pinned, so EC3 didn't get pinned. And then he was, I think, awarded the title back or something like that. And then he just held the title until he dropped it to Matt Hardy when they debuted on, I think it was Pop TV, actually. Which is a shame because EC3 was one of the guys they basically built from the ground up. Yes, he had a name, barely much, barely a name in NXT, and that's nothing against uh, Derek Bateman at all. And I, I just, I just laugh at the name because just of the way they made him seem when he's much less of a goof. He actually is pretty good in the ring and pretty goddamn charismatic on the mic. Impact Wrestling built him from the ground up. He excelled at that i was totally wrong about how that character was going to go over and thankfully it did really go over the problem is, is his reigns were not all that memorable and that's a real that's a real shame for a character like that and his last one ended in what like just early 2016 and he was there in the company for another two years and hold the goddamn thing after that that's a real shame we then get to number oh boy number 18 rvd one reign 113 days RVD should have had a competitive match with AJ Styles, but creative Hogan and Bischoff decided that that wasn't the case. Run through them. Why is what I want to know. Because RVD and AJ Styles could have had a competitive match, and maybe you could have had Styles st you know, uh, steal the win or or um, get to where he, was no, where he <clears throat> got disqualified, and you build it up to a pay-per-view, maybe you have RVD do, uh, win there. Because RVD had a limited, uh, limited number of dates on his contract, and the only reason he only had a 113-day reign is because they had to have Abyss take him out and everything, and then they had to get they had to strip uh, RVD of the world title, and they had to do this whole thing where they built up the Bound for Glory series, which actually was a pretty good idea, and I wish they'd bring that back. And they built it up to you know Bound for Glory 2010, where they arrived. Oh boy, that was fun, but. 
the whole point of this is RVD, it was just another example of using a guy that had a name elsewhere to win the world title and run through one of their originals. And I'm not blaming RVD, I'm blaming creative. It just wasn't the best idea. Still 113 days, I can't sneeze at that. I mean, I could, but it'd be weird to be allergic to that. We think it's a number 17. Raven, one reign, 88 days, NWA champion. Won it at Slammiversary 2005. Held it till just before the debut on Spike TV. I think he won it like a, or he lost it at a Border City Wrestling show in September of 2015. And a big old schmoz and everything and all this. And it, it's a shame that Raven's title reign is forgotten about. Because I actually own, when Impact Wrestling was doing a whole bunch of clearance. Like you know, doing the brown bag special stuff and putting extra DVDs, shirts and whatever in their in their boxes just trying to sell them for such a cheap price that was like what back in like early 2017 i bought like so many of those i got pretty much all the dvds that have raven's uh title reigns on there which were only a few but still i got slammiversary 05 i got a couple others i got unbreakable 05 with that great three-way between uh joe and joe styles and daniels but raven it's a shame that his title reigns almost almost like just pushed by the wayside when it was great to have that guy, yes, he had a name elsewhere. But he did help make Impact Wrestling his own. And he helped that brand as much as he could. Just a shame he didn't get to hold the title longer. <clears throat> but I think it may have been his choice to like lose the title. So anyway, number 16, Ron Killings. Two reigns, 119 days. Beat Ken Shamrock for it in August of 2002. Lost it to Jeff Jarrett in November 2002. And then won it again in, I think, May of 2004. And then lost it soon after. And then I think lost it like Slammiversary just like a little bit later. Which was really, really bizarre. But whatever. Hey, Ron Killings, NWA, uh, African-American NWA world champion. That's a pretty big goddamn deal. Um, I think only his first reign was really that memorable. But still, hey, good for him. Good for him, honestly. He is remembered as an NWA world champion. As he should be. He did pretty well in that company. A lot of people tend to forget that, myself included sometimes. So we get to number 15, Magnus, one reign, 128 days. Now we're getting into the better champions here because we're about half, we're just over halfway through the countdown. And Magnus, you know, Nick Aldis, who is great, spectacular, old school wrestler with a new school mind. Well, he has an old school mind, but also he's a new school wrestler. My point is, is that he respects wrestling, and he is a goddamn great performer. He really is. And I actually enjoyed uh, ordering the NWA Crockett Cup on Fight TV. Really liked that. And that review, you know, just a little cheap plug in to pat myself on the back here. <clears throat> Almost a thousand views, which shocked me. But Magnus, it's a shame that he only got like four months out of that because he really was terrific and could have been one of the guys they built around. He decided to leave and go off on his own and everything and do his own thing. But he was one of those guys that really could have benefited from a super long reign. I'm talking like about six months or eight months. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, for just over four months is fine. I just hope, I just wonder what could have happened if he'd gotten a little bit more. And then we get to number 14, Eli Drake, one reign, 146 days. I mean, hey, good on Eli Drake. I mean, he got he got he got a, he, he's a hell of a talker. Great worker, made a big name for himself in Impact Wrestling. Got got a silly, you know, silly part of a gimmick over. He really did, and I'm not, I'm not saying that he's silly. I'm just saying it's like you put that in the hands of almost anyone else, it would have been seen as silly. He got that over. He did really well, and he deserved to be Impact Wrestling World Champion. And maybe if he had been that a little bit longer, great. But he was a great heel. He was also cheered pretty well because he was super likable. And it's hard to boo a guy that's that good in the ring and that good on the mic. Number 13, Brian Cage, one reign, 150 plus days. As of the recording of this video, it might be around 148. I'm not totally sure on the math of that, <clears throat> since he is the current Impact Wrestling World Champion. For the love of God, don't have Michael Elgin beat him. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what's exactly going on. I don't think they're feuding over the title in the Bound for Glory. I haven't been able to keep up on as much of the TV, but for the love of God, don't have somebody like Michael Elgin beat him. Please, please no. Please no. Brian Cage, got to see him at a Defy Northwest Wrestling show. I think it was one of the first two shows that myself and the Durbinator went to. That was a really, really fun show. Great, great talent. He is really goddamn good in the ring. He he really is. And is somebody, hey, you know, he's, he's dumb. He did well in Lucha Underground. 
he's done well in the Indies. He's done well here in Impact Wrestling. I say here as if, like, you know, <clears throat> but that's all the theme of the show. He is really, really good, and I'm really happy to see him get the success. He has deserved it. He'll probably lose it at Bound for Glory. I think I just remember he's going to face Sammy Callahan. Hmm. Moving on. Number 12, Bully Ray. Two reigns, 196 days. He had one really, really good reign. Like, when he won it, when he won in that whole heel turn and everything, it, he had, actually, I take that back because his reign barely got started. I think it was, like, only a few months in. And then he lost it to Chris Saban, and then he won it back soon after, and then he held it a little bit longer until he lost it to AJ at Bound for Glory 2013. But Bully, booking aside, since he doesn't really know how to book anything, if Ring of Honor's anything to go by, he is, st he is still a hell of a heel, and he did pretty damn well with that championship. He did pretty goddamn well with it. It was <clears throat> something you could buy into. And that story is pretty well built. Too bad they crapped out the whole thing with Aces and Aces afterwards, but... That's another story for another day. Bully Ray, though, pretty tremendous uh, Impact Wrestling World Champion. Number 11, Samoa Joe. One reign, 180 days. It was really difficult to rate Joe this low. The low Joe, if you will. But let's be honest. After he beat Kurt Angle, that was a pretty shit reign. That's not, that's not Joe's fault. It was just shit. It was just booked like shit. It didn't work at all. And ultimately, ultimately, he never got to sniff the title again. Which is, I mean, well, except when he grabbed the title and then handed it to Kurt Angle at Slammiversary 09, because that was a great idea. Except it wasn't. But 180 days, they can't really sneeze at that. It's just a shame they didn't give him better material. They didn't give him better feuds. That feud of Booker T just wasn't that good. I'm sorry, it just wasn't. The, the match of Sting, where he lost the title ultimately, was pretty goddamn good. <laughs> but, nah. Whatever, Samoa Joe is, was a great, or as great of a champion as he could be. It's just a shame it wasn't booked better. Number 10, Johnny Impact. One reign, 196 days. John Morrison's great. He, uh, he's another guy that myself and Durbinator got to meet at a Defy Northwest wrestling show. Also got to meet his wife, Taya Valkyrie. Who's also very good in the ring and actually opened my eyes to how good she is being able to see her live, even though I knew she was good before. He is somebody that the company could have built around, I mean, and they gave him a lengthy reign. It was like, it was like six and a half months. It's not like they just jobbed him out and everything. And he left the company recently, I believe. I don't know where he's going. Probably AEW. Hell, he might go to Japan. Who the hell knows? <laughs> but he, he was somebody that made that title mean something. He delivered great match after great match. He was crazy heel, crazy baby face. Didn't matter. He was somebody you could rely on to deliver, to deliver and be your champion and show up and, make things work. Then we get to number nine, Jeff Hardy, three reigns, 249 days. So yeah, Jeff Hardy won the title at, um, in two, in 2010, Bound for Glory 2010, and then lost it to Mr. Anderson, Anderson, then won it back and then lost it to Sting. The whole victory road, uh, things followed soon afterwards. And then he had a road to redemption thing and won it at Bound for Glory 2012 and then lost it eventually to Bully Ray. That was, I believe his longest reign. Jeff Hardy, hey, he was he was somebody that they built around, and sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes it did work. That redemption angle did work pretty damn well, and it's good. Is hopefully he's cleaned up now <clears throat> since he's back in WWE, recovering from a leg injury. But focusing on just his Impact Wrestling run, yeah, he had some pretty he had some pretty good stuff to him. He had some pretty good stuff to his reigns, even if the first two maybe weren't all that memorable for the right reasons. That, that third one was pretty good and why I put him up here. Number eight, Austin Aries. Three reigns, 373 days combined. I mean, he was the original originator of option C, cashing in, beating Bobby Roode, losing that Bound for Glory 2012 to Jeff Hardy, and then winning the titles a couple times afterwards when he went back to the company. Do not get me wrong, Austin Aries is a hell of a wrestler. I mean, there are a lot of people that maybe think that he's not the best guy. I mean... I, yeah, I mean, it, it that does seem to jive. There are some people that say say good things about him, bad things about him. I never met the guy, so I can't really say anything. But as a wrestler and as somebody that was in Impact Wrestling, bouncing around a whole lot because he bounced from there to Ring of Honor to back to Impact and all that, he was somebody that made that title mean something. And that whole originator of Option C, got to put him up here for that, if for nothing, if nothing more. And then we get to number seven, Christian Cage, two reigns, 245 days, NWA champion. 
Yep, he won it at uh, against all odds, two thousand six against Jeff Jarrett. They tried to recreate the Montreal Screwjob thing, but they didn't do that. They waited till Slammiversary '06 to recreate that. That was a great idea, and then he won the NWA title again. I believe in May of, or no, not May. He lost it in May of '07. He won it in January of '07, and I think it's a real shame he did not win. Maybe he didn't like you know beat Samoa Joe for the title and stuff like that. Even though by that point, I think uh, Christian Cage had, or Christian had, uh, you know, just come up with the idea, you know what, I'm just going to go back to WWE, uh, which is a shame. Impact featured him as a star, the star he should have been. It's a real shame that he was not featured um, better once he got away from Impact. His title reigns are pretty good. Number six, this may surprise some people that I rank him this low, but I got reasons. Jeff Jarrett, six reigns, 1,005 days as the NWA champion. So he beats uh, Ronda Truth Killings in November of 2002. He waited a full five months before he made himself champion. And then he feuded with Raven over it. And then he feuded with AJ Styles over it. And AJ Styles, who will get mentioned here in a bit. He, you know, they feuded over the title for that. And then Jeff Jarrett just kept a stranglehold on the title. Where he became the King of the Mountain. <clears throat> and... At, you know, the Slammiversary show. Well, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't Slammiversary pay-per-view. Because we're still doing their weekly pay-per-views. But it was the early June 2004 show where he won the King of the Mountain match. And then held it for almost a year. I think he dropped it a Hard Justice 2005. And that was and that was to AJ. And then AJ dropped it a little bit later. Raven won it. And then, Ra and then Jeff Jarrett beat Raven for it. And then held it till Bound for Glory. And then won it back from Rhino. And then held it pretty much almost for, <clears throat> well, held it till Christian Cade beat him. That stuff I said before. 1,005 days. It's just the problem is that Jeff Jarrett had such a stranglehold on it, it got to the point where it was just sickening. If Jeff Jarrett had held it 200 less days, I mean, I don't know if anybody would argue about numbers. I think it would have worked a whole lot better. Unfortunately, it got to where people were just sick of him. Um, and he had to go away. And fortunately, he did not touch the uh, world title after that. I mean, granted, he was gone for the majority of two years after that, given the fact that his wife at the time, Jill, had passed away from, due to cancer, which, you know, <clears throat> cancer's a bitch. That much I'll say. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But once Jeff Jarrett came back, he came back for a bit, and then he and it was like, go, and all that. But just focusing on his title reigns, it got sickening, seeing him as champion. It just was to the point where nobody wanted to see it anymore. They wanted, they wanted him to go away. Number five, Bobby Roode, two reigns, 367 days. He was a long reigning champion. My God, was he ever <clears throat> good God. He was a great champion. He really, really was. He was the longest reigning Impact Wrestling World Champion I believe that there has been. Like nearly 300 days or something like that, or damn close to 300 days. He was somebody you could rely on. That was really fucking good. And it's still really fucking good. Do not get me wrong, but he is an Impact original, and somebody that was great. And finally, to see him get that title run was absolutely incredible. It's just a shame now that he's basically being dropped out on WWE TV. But his two reigns, that meant a whole lot. <clears throat> he was somebody you could rely on as a great heel, great babyface, whatever. But my God, he excels a heel. Number four, Lashley. Four reigns, 403 days. That's how you use Lashley. Look at how Impact Wrestling used Lashley and do that. All you have to do is use him like that. But no, WWE doesn't want to use him like that. After being in WWE for a while, he left. He made an, he made a brief run in Impact Wrestling for a little bit and then did MMA stuff. And then when he came back, he developed into a hell of a heel. Hell of a performing heel. The guy, yeah, he's never that great on the mic, but he's still pretty goddamn good, uh, you know, when he's given, like, just short things to say. This is how you book the guy. I just wish uh, WWE would have, but they didn't. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> still, his reigns as Impact Champion, sure, it only averages out to just over 100 days, but still, he is really, really good. Number three, Sting, with four reigns as uh, the TNA Champion of 326 days and one reign under the NWA TNA banner for 28 days. Now, I could have included his previous NWA uh, run, but that wasn't in TNA. That was in WCW. So still, for a combined, you know, for a combined 354 days, him as a champion in the runs in that company, it actually made a whole lot of sense. 
because he was the icon. He was the man called Sting. I mean, he still is, but there's a reason why he was featured there so much, mainly because he was getting paid like almost about 500 grand a year to just work TV and work pay-per-views. But he was somebody that, sure, he was a bit washed by the time it got to about 2011. That was pretty obvious. But he was somebody for a period of years, from about 06 to 09, he was somebody that was really goddamn good as champion. And actually, I would argue his run from Bound for Glory 08 to Lockdown 09 as champion was really good. And that match he had with Mick Foley was pretty fun. Sure, it was old school and a bit ridiculous, but it was pretty good. So yeah, Sting, got to feature him here. But number two, AJ Styles, two reigns, 220 days with the TNA title, three reigns, 196 days with the NWA TNA title. If it wasn't for the number one choice, AJ Styles would be up there. AJ Styles is fucking incredible and still is to this day. He is doing some great shit. And he was the he was the Impact Wrestling icon. He really was, and I wish that they would have tried to keep him and not lowball him. But then again, he went to New Japan, did some great things, and has been doing some great things in WWE despite some of the shit booking they've given him. He was the guy in Impact Wrestling, and Dixie was an idiot to let him go. But still, it took him a while to become the TNA era champion. But at least when he did, at least it meant something. It was a shame that, you know, he got eaten alive by RVD. But his second run, less so, you know, when he went to Bound for Glory 2013 and barely held it for a while before getting the title stripped from him because, <clears throat> oh yeah, he was insulted by the lowball offer from Dixie Carter. Hey, at least AJ's doing some great things now. And he left it, he left a huge footprint on Impact Wrestling. Number one, Kurt Angle, six days, six hundred or six reigns, six hundred and eight days. I mean, come on. He was featured as the guy for you know a long time in Impact and always put people over, had some great matches, even maybe when he shouldn't have been wrestling as much on TV. He still wanted to get out there and wrestle. He still wanted to do a whole bunch of great things. And that's what Kurt Angle did. And Kurt Angle had a longer run in Impact Wrestling than he had in WWE. Um, a lot of people forget that. Myself included sometimes, unless I remember all the facts. From his first win, you know, from his first win, like, <clears throat> in 2007, all the way to, like, 2015, when he kept holding, when he kept holding championships, he, every time he held a title, he meant something. It meant something. It meant it meant the world. He was the guy. Face or heel, didn't matter. Kurt Angle deserves a number one spot. So that's going to be it right there. I hope you guys enjoyed this list. But agree, disagree with what I said. Like, share, subscribe. Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Ritland. I'll see you soon.